Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Efren Olivares. For those of you that don't know me, um, I live here in New York City. Um, I am uh, someone that loved art history when I was in college, but wound up actually getting a business degree. It was, it was at the time considered more practical. And yet now, more recently, after being in the business world for many years, I went back and got a master's of art at Christie's Education. And one of the things I learned during that program is I loved photography. I really loved the medium. And you know what? My art history classes at Penn, they didn't cover photography. If you remember books in college of art history, they it really was kind of like the Oh, we don't, we don't do that. You know, we do painting, we do sculpture, we don't do photography. So I think maybe that was part of the reason why I was like, oh my God, look at this. When I was studying it, I got so into it. Um, it was more foreign to me. And, and maybe it felt like it was also a little bit more manageable. I thought, you know, this is an area that maybe even if I'm starting my, my art life later, I can really kind of embrace and start getting to, to really know well. So I'm sorry, I, I just want to turn this off. I don't know why this is. Um... Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what I did is normally I take people on wonderful tours of art galleries in New York. After I graduated from Christie's, I, I did work at the Christie's uh, auction house briefly at their photographs department, which was a, a real thrill. And then I wound up working at a gallery in Chelsea here in New York focused on photography. And so that taught me a bit more about photography. And then I did, you know, I set up a, a, a little tour company. I take people on tours of galleries. Of course, when COVID came, the galleries mostly shut down. So I thought, well, maybe I should move this to Zoom. So I launched a series of uh, lectures focused on photography. Many of you have gone to them and many of them, frankly, were, were more lecture-like. They were surveys. Let's look at women photographers since the 19th century. Let's look at art photography of kids since the 19th century, things like that. And then the idea emerged of um, how about getting to know real life photographers <laughs> that can actually join us on the call and for us to look at their work with them. And some of you might've been to the first and most recent one of those with Daniel Handel. And now it's my pleasure to be here for a second time. Oh, and there's Daniel. I actually see Daniel on the call. He was our first guinea pig victim or star uh, and, and people enjoyed seeing Daniel's work. And today it's my pleasure to have Tim Porter with us. Uh, there he is uh, with a little Christmas tree behind him. And I'm thrilled that he's joined us. Um, I just wanna give you a little bit of background. Tim Porter is, has a background not only in a lot of in journalism, but of course in photography as well. He spent uh, many years um, at the San Francisco Examiner in, in a major editor role there. Um, I'm sorry if I got it wrong, Tim. I think it was, is it assistant editor at large or <laughs> it was a, like that. assistant managing editor? Yes, big, Close big enough. role. And, and I think um, what he's done, um, at the San Francisco Examiner, what, one of the things he did as well is when they started moving into the online, as you know, newspapers have gone online, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. He was actually in charge of that whole initiative of moving the San Francisco, San Francisco Examiner to be an online platform. And as we know, that's how a lot of us now read our news. Um, but he's also been the editor uh, and extremely involved with Marin, magazine, Marin County Magazine, where he lives. So we'll, we'll look at that as well. But the point being is that after those big, big endeavors in, in the world of newspapers and magazines, he, he really uh, went uh, towards something that he always suspected he would love, which is really photography per se. So what we're going to be seeing today is, is some of the output that Tim has 
has been involved with for, I think it's about seven or eight years now. Um, and why don't we just get started? Cause I think the supporting slides will, will help a lot. Thank you, Tim, so much for, for being here with us. Efren, thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you. So what I'm gonna do, there's three steps to this. The first one's gonna be that I'm gonna share my screen. <laughs> and once you see that, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to ask all of you to go to the top of your screen. There's going to be a place that says viewing options. And I'm going to ask you to click on side by side view. Because what that's going to do, which is really important, is it's going to put the slides on the left and your nice little faces and ours on the right. That way we're not covering Tim's great work. And then once you do that, if it's okay, I'm gonna mute all of you just so that um, we, you know, we don't hear you too much during the, the talk, but we'll be back so we can do questions, Q&A and all that good stuff. So let's see, I'm gonna hide this. Okay, let's see, participants. Give me one second and I'm just gonna mute here. Mute all. And and Tim, I'm just gonna ask you to unmute yourself after I mute all, okay? Okay. <laughs> and now I'm gonna go to you. Oh, you're actually still there. So I think we're good. So can everyone see and Okay, so there's Tim and uh, <laughs> he's sitting in a chair and um, apparently it was extremely hot. And what we're gonna have, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna do the quick geography lesson because I think it's important for people to remember, Tim's actually in Marin County. Many of you know Marin, it's one of the most beautiful parts of probably the country and California. That's where the Golden Gate Bridge takes you. And it's also where you have lovely things like the Muir Woods. But the other part of the geography lesson I wanted you to see is to show you where Tim has been spending a lot of time. And a lot of people have heard of Oaxaca, but I thought it would be important to just show you that it is one of the 33 states in, the, in Mexico. It's right there. It's um, towards the very south of the Pacific coast. And it's not only a state, it's also a city. So um, that's important to know. Uh, the only other thing I'm gonna tell you about Oaxaca, which is remarkable, uh, maybe kind of sad because we don't want it to be too overrun by tourists, but in 2020, Travel and Leisure voted Oaxaca the number one city, best city in the entire world, followed by another city in Mexico, San Miguel de Allende. So Mexico is very hot right now. And by the way, these are not, you know, Cancun kind of resort cities. These are cities in the interior of the country. And I just thought I would show you that, that these are the kinds of pictures you normally see about Oaxaca, which we're gonna learn, Tim was told, you know, you don't wanna do stuff that's that magazine-y, especially with his background in magazines and newspapers. Um, but I just thought I would throw in three um, of the famous dishes from Oaxaca. One is called Tlayuda. And I'm happy that Taco Bell has not launched a Tlayuda. <laughs> it's still something a little less known. This is mole negro. Mole de Oaxaca is particularly dark. And these, we'll have to ask Tim if he's tried them, are chapulines. They're Oaxaca grasshoppers. Uh -huh. But let's get to Tim because that's the exciting part of tonight. When you read, when you see Tim's website and his blogs, he write, you know, he was a journalist. So he loves writing and he, he, he references images and he writes about his images. So I wanted to put these up because in one of his blogs, um, Tim, you talk about 
having bumped into these images when you were a young man. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about them, why they were important to you. Sure, Efren. Um, so these, I probably saw these pictures around 1972. I was returning to um, college after having worked my way down academically from a, a good school in New York to a city college in San Francisco. Um, and as you all know, those were sort of turbulent times in the United States, especially here on the West Coast and in other New York City, Columbia, et cetera. And um, I was in the school library and um, came across these in a magazine. Um, and I didn't know who Mary Ellen Mark was. Um, and I probably couldn't even have told you where Bombay, India was. Um, but I saw the photographs and they remind me of the people that I had been hanging around with for the last couple of years. And the only other pictures I had seen until that point uh, were pictures of demonstrations, anti-war protests, uh, uh, drug use, all the things that were associated with the, the sort of hippies uh, movement of the United States. So I saw these pictures and they were very moving and then I you know, I went back to the library and I looked up Mary Ellen Mark and saw some of her other books and, and um, her work in India and things like that. And um, it was just very moving to me. And that was the reason that I took my first photography class. Uh, that, you know, seeing this type of, of photograph, which was nothing like you would have seen in uh, an American newspaper or even most um, well, in magazines, because in magazines then, like these were in Life magazine, I believe, and um, uh, or something like that. And uh, but they were just something very moving to me when I saw them. And um, shortly after that, I bought a used uh, Pentax camera for not much money and began taking pictures, uh, walking around the streets of San Francisco taking pictures. So it was 1972, I would say. Well, um, let's see if. Uh, so, so here I, I put up, you know, two of the publications that you really spend a lot of time with. Maybe you can walk us through a, a, a bit of each. Uh, in particular, I, I remember reading about your approach to the San Francisco Examiner, I believe was initially, you were hoping to show your pictures, your photographs, is, is yeah, kind of where your art was. Yeah, I wanted to be a photographer. And so, um, and I was photographing in San Francisco, um, you know, in the mid seventies, um, shooting for the wire services, which sounds like a big deal, but it, you know, I, I, we were paid $15 a picture to photograph sports teams or protests on the street, or there was the Patty Hearst kidnapping. I photographed that for about a year. And so it was news, news photography, and I was not very good at it. Uh, but I was young, and so I didn't really know that I wasn't very good at it. Um, and I kept trying to get a job on a newspaper. And I landed a job as a gopher, a clerk on the Examiner, which was owned by the Hearst Corporation at the time, and uh, right down the street from Efren's apartment. And um, I pestered them while working as a gopher for a year and a half or so to hire me as a photographer, and, and they didn't. Um, and I felt, felt chastened and rejected, et cetera. And so I ended up taking a job as, uh, as a reporter on a newspaper um, because it seemed easier to be a reporter than it did to be a photographer. Um, again, uh, that youthful wisdom. Um, and so I began working on a little small newspaper in Nevada as a reporter and a photographer, which I did for a couple of years. And then to abbreviate the story, I worked on a couple of papers in between. I was the editor of a paper in Berkeley and Richmond, California when I was 30. And I finally got back to the Examiner in 1984 as a, what was called a city editor. And uh, meaning that you assigned reporters stories. And I worked there for 16 or 17 years, um, running the reporting, um, designing the front page, doing yeah, uh, all those sorts of things. It was very exciting. There was a two newspaper city. People still read newspapers. It was pre-internet. Um, and, you know, it, it, we felt like we were in the middle of everything. Um, mm -hmm. And as Efren mentioned in 1995, 
uh, I and another guy built the newspaper's first website. Um, and it was the second newspaper website. In the and um, we put on a strike at the newspaper. Um, and then so I spent four years building for the Examiner and with the Hearst Corporation for its other newspapers, uh, which at the time were in places like Houston and San Antonio and um, other places like that. So I did that until uh, about 2000. And then I left to go to work for a startup because that was in San Francisco was the first internet boom, uh, the 90s, you know, um, uh, pet.com, a lot of famous now, you know, vanished companies. Um, I worked for, I built websites for fi a financial services company that was a product of Goldman Sachs and Charles Schwab. And so I built an editing system for them, a digital editing system. I did that for a couple of years. Uh, the company got sold and I was 51 years old or so and out of work with a, with a little bit of a paycheck that I'd gotten from the sale of the company. And I didn't really know what to do. Um, so I, I like to joke when I tell the story, I said, well, what do, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You get a grant. So I got a grant and uh, to, invest, <laughs> to sort of like work on innovation in the newspaper industry. And it made me travel around the country for a couple of years. And I, uh, my wife had given me a little digital camera. I still had my old Nikons. So I took my camera with me as I traveled. And I was running then. I would get up in Philadelphia or Portland or Fort Lauderdale and at five or six in the morning to beat the jet lag. And I would run on the streets with my camera and take snapshots of the city. And when the grant finished and we did a book, et cetera, and uh, we did not save the newspaper industry as is pretty obvious. Um, I, then I really didn't know what to do. And just by chance, I had a friend who was starting this magazine you see on the right here in Marin County, which is just North of San Francisco. And it's a lifestyle magazine. I'm sure you, you know what they're, what they're like. And she wanted me to be the editor of the magazine. And I said, I'm done with editing. Uh, I don't want to be in charge of anything anymore. I've been in charge for 20 plus years. I said, I'm, I'll, I'll write and, and I'll take pictures. So that's when I started photographing again, almost full time. Uh, so that was about um, let's see, 2000, about 15 years ago, I would say, or something like that. And so I, I was their chief or principal, I guess is the way to put it, photographer for eight years. Uh, as I told Efren, um, it's, you know, it's, I photographed everything that has to do, I mean, food, restaurants, people, portraits, uh, the beaches, covers, um, real estate, um, expensive houses, um, things like that. Wealthy people, which there are a lot here in the <laughs> county. And, uh, and I loved it. Uh, you know, it, it was great. And it, it, it got me, it really immersed me once again in photography. And, um, um, and that's how, really how I got back into it. And, and that's, that's a great segue because, by the way, that, that beautiful image there on the cover of Marin is, uh, is Tim's photograph. Um, but so here you have someone that's incredibly proficient technically doing photography um, and um, but doing it for, you know, again, with almost very magazine kind of lifestyle look. And now you're going to tell us how you landed in Oaxaca and, um, and this incredible fact that you met that woman, uh, that photographer who's images had moved you back in the 70s it's a great story so my wife and i my, my um when i met my wife she had a connection to oaxaca as a girl um i mean a teenager she had gone there to study spanish and become very involved with the family they kind of she and the family kind of adopted each other so when she and i started going out in the mid 90s um i started going to oaxaca with her i'd been to mexico before but had never been to Oaxaca. And I became very involved, obviously, with the, the family of her family. They were like her padrinos, which are her godparents. And um, we built a house there. We own land there. And but as I think I mentioned, Efren, I would go there on vacation because I was still working here and working a lot. And um, 
I would go there and photograph, I would make snapshots of, you know, touristy things and our friends and stuff like that. I didn't do any serious photography. Um, and um, to abbrevi I'm gonna to try to really abbreviate this, but in, so in 2012, I went to a gallery opening of a New York artist who was living in, in uh, Oaxaca at the time, a graphic artist named Peter Cooper. Peter Cooper, among other things, draws Spy versus Spy for Mad Magazine. Out of <laughs> and uh, he's a graphic uh, novelist and graphic artist. And he was having a show. And I went to the show with a friend. And I saw this flyer on the door for a photography workshop in Oaxaca with Mary Ellen Mark. And it was, you know, it was that sort of Paul on the road to Rome, struck down, blinded, or whatever happened to Paul, I don't remember. But it was just, I, I was struck by it. And I got into a conversation with somebody at the uh, opening who was actually the curator of the show. And she told me when I was introduced to her that uh, as a photographer who was considering taking this workshop, she said, I shouldn't do it. It's just a waste of time. It's for wannabes. It's just a way to make money. You know, it's just, it's no good, et cetera. And then this was so dissonant for me because I, by this point, I, even though I had not been, you know, working in this type of photography, I'd been reading more about it. Mary Ellen Mark was very famous, very well known, most prominent woman documentary photographer you know, on the planet. And I'm thinking like, how could her Cayetta, her workshop here be like, you know, for wannabes. So I came back to the US after the trip and I called the guy that organizes these uh, trips. He, he was a guy from Mexico City, Efron, he was in, he was in Miami. And I talked to him, his name is Hernan Cortez. And I said, Hernan, like, uh, what's the deal? You know, like, I'm an old guy. I'm not a kid. I don't need to learn how to, like, focus a camera. I mean, it costs 3,000 bucks. I mean, is there anything in it for me? And he, you know, he talked to me and gave me a pitch. I said, no, nah, I don't know. And, and he said, he said, well, you know what? Why don't I have Mary Ellen call you? Would you like to talk to her? I said, yeah, sure. So we hung up and uh, you know, after 20 years, 25 years in journalism, you don't actually believe everything people tell you. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. And 20 minutes later, the phone rings and Mary Ellen was calling. We exchanged niceties for about 30 seconds. And then she told me without any other preamble, I want to know who told you that. I want to know who told you that my workshop is for wannabes. <laughs> and I felt very taken aback. She's, you know, she was, she was a New Yorker. You know, she lived in Soho. Uh, from Pennsylvania, super assertive. Uh, and um, I said, hey, look, I don't want to, you know, get in the middle of whatever, you know. And um, so she said, um, she said to me, she said, well, I'm going to tell you something. She said, whoever told you that is a fucking liar. And I thought at that moment, I knew I was taking her workshop. Uh, <laughs> so, so I went to Oaxaca and, you know, they're abbreviated and I, I took all the workshops I could take with her over the next uh, three years, uh, two and a half years. She died in 2015. So I took five workshops with her. She, um, I went to see her in New York. She, uh, you know, became a friend and as much of a mentor as someone could be to a man who's already, you know, in his, in his sixties, you know, and, um, and I decided after that first workshop, and as you can see it here in February 2013, that I was going to go to Oaxaca as much as I could and pursue documentary photography there. And she, um, and so that's how it started in 2013. I, um, I put two quotes up here from Mary Ellen Mark because um, I, I read them in your blogs and I think they speak to kind of like two of her philosophies. I mean, I'm sure she had many more, but, but one of them has to do with her interest in what she calls people on the edges. You know, she said, I, I feel an affinity for people who haven't had the best breaks in society. I, what I wanna do more than anything is acknowledge their existence. And, and in another quote I picked up is, um, this whole idea of, you know, photograph the world as it is, nothing's more interesting than reality. So I don't know if you want to comment on these, but as we start now looking at your foot photography, I, I actually, I think it, it does a lot of this. This is kind of what it lives by. Well, know? Alfred, if you think of those, those first two pictures, those two hippie kids in India, uh, 
stoned or however they were at the time staring into space they, they were they were they were people on the edges as well mm -hmm. and, and, uh, right. and that's what she did if you're familiar with her work um and she had certain passions mm -hmm. that she followed like circuses uh and some families and things like that yeah and, and to me is really powerful because that's how i started in photography that's what the idea of journalism is but then for eight years or nine years, I've been doing magazine work. And if any of you have ever done that, there's nothing real about magazine photography, or at least at least lifestyle photography. Uh, magazines think nothing about changing the colors of anything or moving things around. It, it's illustration mm -hmm. as much as anything else. Um, so the reality thing really uh, was important to me. And and as 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 I I, I spoke with Tim, uh, you know, before this this presentation, this talk, and and I was. I was really interested by when Tim said that in those workshops, you know, he would present work to Mary Ellen and, you know, some of it he would like and other stuff she would kind of not reject, but kind of say, this is not really what, what we want. And uh, so I included some of, uh, Tim kindly sent me some of the kind of the rejected photographs. And this one, for instance, which is, is really beautiful, uh, but she thought kind of like, this is like too pretty, right? Um, yes, yeah, to stay too um, sort of uh, static in a way. It's, you know, it's a, it is sort of a magazine picture. I started taking, I took pictures when I started with her, it, like I took them for the magazine. And, you know, I, I was technically very good because I, I worked all those years doing that. And so um, I could take a nice picture anywhere. Um, and so as a starting point, I could take better pictures than some people, you know, but, but sure. it, it wasn't really stretching myself uh, to do that. So this, you know, it, it's a little pretty, it's a pretty girl wearing a princess outfit sitting on a couch. That um, doesn't uh, say that much. And, you know, the same thing here was just kind of you know, it's a nice image, but it's, I, I always used to frame things like this too, because then I could put type over one side <laughs> or something like that. I mean, it's such a magazine thing to like, oh, we could put the headline over here on the left. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, it, it's instinct, it's sort of an instinctive thing. I mean, the light is pretty again, but it, it, you know, they, other than being, you know, having pretty light and, you know, nice uh, tonality, you know, it's uh, a kind of a static photograph, I thought. And then, all right, so I, I uh, a, a friend took me to this garbage dump in Mexico where there's a group of people that are called pepinadores in Spanish, it means pickers, they pick through the garbage, this happens all over the world and all major through world cultures. Anyhow, I, I photographed there a number of times and um, I made some good pictures and I, I spent an entire afternoon photographing this kid and his brother working on a garbage truck. And I thought this was the best, you know, a great picture. And uh, she didn't like it at all. I mean, Marion was effort, Marion was not shy at all. She was very direct. Um, and she just thought it was posed. It was too a little gimmicky. You know, it's like, you know, and this is one of those instances where, as the photographer, you get very invested in making the picture. I mean, you spend a lot of time, you're climbing over garbage, you know, you just barbed yeah. wire. And, you, know, it's just, you, you finally take this picture that you think looks pretty cool and it's just, you just love it, right? You know, I just think like, you know, the story about making the picture is better than the picture. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what it comes down to, you know? I mean, it's a great story about making the picture. Um, and here's one that she really liked, right? Yeah, that's one she liked. Uh, be, because he's, I don't know why exactly, and I can't speak for her, but I, you know, I like this one better too. It's the vehicles, his hands, the face, and I lit it as you could tell. I mean, because yeah. it's I, I, I carried a, a strobe in one hand and the camera in the other hand. Uh, it's an old journalism technique. Um, and, uh, you know, and I would approach people there and ask them if I could photograph them. Um, I mean, it's the, as you'll see in the other pictures, uh, I mean, I photograph on the street, but all the pictures of people who are close to me or, or something like that are all, they, obviously they know I'm, I'm like two feet from the man. And yeah. uh, 
I've asked to move. And I shot three or four frames probably. And and again, you're gonna we're gonna see a lot of images now. Um, but uh, this is in keeping with something Tim describes as you know my Oaxaca. It's not it's not the Oaxaca that you're gonna see in magazines that promotes tourism. It's um, it's a much more real, uh, and I, I agree. These people that that spend time, you know, looking through garbage is—it's it's just it's kind of a really terrifying profession, right? But it's it's real, and it's they're there, and um, you're you're, and then this one she liked as well. Yeah, in comparison to the young girl that's sitting on the couch, this is actually from the same um, type of event. It's a uh, uh, pray, what do you call it? Um, it's like the it, it's like carnival. Only yeah. it's, it happens before the Christian, the Catholic um, Lent uh, celebration. So they have a part, a big party in this particular town called San Martin Tilcajete. And each year, one teenage boy is chosen to be the bride, the novia. And um, so in this case, uh, I, you know, in this case, I like this picture much better too, just, just because of the elements in the photograph and the, the lighting, which is, again, is more harsh. And again, I lit it with the same technique. It's, um, you know, I'm holding a flash over my head with one hand and I focus the camera with the other hand. Um, but yeah, I think it's a nice, I really like the picture. Without the horse, it's not anywhere near as good. Um, okay. Yeah, you talked about the importance of kind of giving these people some context, you know, kind of seeing like where do they live, what's around them, as opposed to kind of a portrait that just has, you know, kind of a, a plain neutral background. And these, you really get to see and feel kind of like, where are they? And there's the horse and there's, you know, there's the structure behind. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about some of the work you've done, which I think is fascinating because you really spend a lot of years working with some particular people and, and especially these women uh, that, that are single moms. Um, and and the, the, some of the pictures, they're very intimate and you really, you've gotten to know someone like Irma um, they've kind of allowed you to join them in their home and their families, which makes it very, very special, right? These are not strangers, and these are people that are really letting you come into their lives. And maybe you can also talk about, you know, the difficulties of, you know, how do you capture people in a natural, intimate way when at the end of the day, they're like, yeah, but he's here. So right. it's not exactly the same as uh, when we're kind of, without them. Um. Um. Well, in, in her case, uh, you know, there's been a, a short history. Uh, in 2014, I started photographing a children's shelter um, that housed about 45 kids, uh, some of whom were the children of um, prostitutes and others were just uh, the, ch the children of uh, mothers, really, uh, who worked a lot and uh, couldn't afford to take care of their kids. So Irma worked. Uh, she's a, a, an indigenous woman from southern Mexico, a, a, a culture called Mije, M-I-X-E. And um, she had two kids at the time. And uh, I was photographing in the shelter and I was pestering the owner, the founder of the shelter, to introduce me to the mothers because I was making these pictures of the kids. And I, but I, I wanted to, as Efren just said, I, I, I wanted to find the context for the kids. I mean, there's a reason kids are in shelters and the reason is that the, you know, the parents can't take care of them for reason A, B, or C. And so she introduced me to Irma in 2014, and I've been photographing Irma and her two kids, and now three, uh, ever since, four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. I'm in Oaxaca for two to three weeks at a time. So I have visited her, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 times. Um, and um, as you'll see, there's some a selection here. I, I photographed all sorts of, um, of uh, events, not events, but moments with her. In those four years, she's moved four times. She had a baby. Um, her kids, one of them graduated from school, another one went away. Um, but mainly I go over and I just hang out with them and, you know, um, and stay with them while they're doing whatever they're doing. Because sometimes we go do something. Um, 
and but they don't have a lot of free time to go like you know go to the the park or something you know so um but i've you know we've gone out in the evening to the socolo which is the main square in a mexican town and um you know it's i i hang around until they basically ignore me Efren. that's really what i do and you know they completely now uh, this family so I have, a, you know, I have hundreds of pictures of them posed looking at the camera, especially the kids. That's what kids do. Um, so, but none of these are, a couple of them are posed. The opening picture of her standing by the wall when she was super pregnant, um, I posed that one. But most of them, they're just hanging around. And, um, and I shoot, uh, you know, some days are more successful than others, obviously. Some days you get nothing. Some day, other days I come back and like this one was, this the young girl in the middle, his name is Betsy, Betsy Michelle. And Betsy um, graduated from sixth grade, uh, I wanna say last year, but now we've missed a whole year due to COVID. So almost two years ago. Uh, and so kids get really dressed up, to, even the poorest of kids get really dressed up for their graduations. And, um, and the sixth grade is the average um, education level in Oaxaca, by the way. Um, so anyhow, and this is, this is a more journalistic picture in a sense that we're walking down the street after the graduation and I'm walking backwards. Right. And I'm photographing them as they're walking toward me. Um, and so you know, the, I think uh, the, word, the, the word that comes to mind, of course, when we spoke is int intimate. There's something very intimate about these photographs. The fact that you really have gotten to know Edema and her kids and they let you into their lives and, let you shoot that close and in kind of in the most natural possible way. And of course, some of the themes that cut across these, um, you know, wow, the, the job of being a single mom is of right. course, <laughs> just okay. the, one of the toughest possible things, right? And yet they find the time to get dressed up, you know, celebrate la graduación, celebrate the graduation. Um, the people in Mexico have an, an uncanny ability to to stay happy and to celebrate life even under really difficult circumstances, right? I, I have to say that Irma is about five foot one and she moves at a speed that would put most New Yorkers to <laughs> It's just, I mean, there's never, it's from one thing to the next, one thing to the next. And, and you're right, that's, uh, that's, I mean, just I'll just throw it out here because the pictures are close. I, you know, I, I shoot with a, 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 a 28 millimeter lens and a 24 millimeter lens and a 50 millimeter lens. So I'm always, most of the time I'm within a, a few feet of, of the person or less sometimes. I love this one because it's almost like this moment of like, I actually get to sit and relax and ponder and think about life. And and I, I love all these these kind of like, different retratos or portraits and photographs in the back, some a little crooked and so on. But again, it gives that whole context, right? Like here mm -hmm. she is in, you get, you get a feeling for, for this place. Her name, is, her name is Alberta and she uh, is Oaxacan, but she lived in New York City for uh, nine or 10 years. There she is there. That is incredible. We have three children that were born in New York City that you'll see. I've been photographing them in Mexico, but last year they moved back to Queens where they live with their father, who's uh, undocumented. Yeah, you, you, uh, you, you really grew interested in that whole topic of, you know, people from Mexico that have lived in the U.S. and are now back in their country. Um, and Again, um, you know, you capture the uh, the closeness and the relationship of these single mothers with their children, even as they're really busy, probably cooking in this case. A really intimate, again, it feels like you're right there, part of the family. And I love this again. These kids like really, really hugging and, and kind of like embracing their mom. Their mom is like, they're basically their, mm -hmm. their you know, their, their protector, their tutor, their mentor. Um, and this one as well, it's really beautiful. And, and for them to let you capture this, I mean, it, it really actually looks incredibly natural. It doesn't look like- well, We're all just sitting there. I mean, if you, um, 
there's a big patio outside their house, uh, a cement house. Or, or her father is a farmer, and um, he's got uh, six or eight cows, and they make money by selling cheese. Um, so they're relatively well off. Anyhow, they they spend a lot of time when they're not working and just hang out on the patio. And, and that's what I do. I, I hang out with them and we talk and we tease each other or, uh, you know, <laughs> things like that. And then I, if they do something, I take a picture of it. And then I, like, I sit there with the camera right on the floor next to me or in my lap. And so on this night we went out, we went out, she was going to participate in a little dance group. And yeah. so she's wearing what's called a wipil, it's a mm -hmm. H-U-I-P-I-L, which is the a blouse or a skirt from Oaxaca. And uh, this particular pattern is from the coast of Oaxaca. I think it's called the Pinotepa. That's a beautiful That's image. Yeah. So now um, that, that spoke a little bit to your work, kind of call it your intimate ongoing work with some of these women but 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 again here and and by the way for the audience uh, the sections of this presentation follow some sections that tim created for his website this section really is the section that focuses on niños y madres you know the kids and mothers and again i love it's amazing how often it's almost a, i guess i'm like a single guy in new york i forget how attached children are to their moms, right? And I keep seeing that image of like the kids just like grabbing on for dear life. Uh, this, this is amazing because when I first saw this picture, I thought this bird was real and it was alive. Tell us about how you found this uh, and captured this great image. Well, this, this family is one of the families that works in the garbage dump mm -hmm. and uh, a a fellow I know, uh, another photographer, has been photographing this family for a long time. And so I didn't want to take pictures of them, but I was photographing their, their neighbors or others, you know. And so after the, the work day, I, yeah, uh, we uh, went from the dump to their house, which is not too far away, and they got cleaned up a little bit. And we were standing on a street just talking. Again, that's I, yeah, I spend most of my time talking. And, um, you know, the father comes around and uh, he says to me, he says, uh, would you like to see my eagle? So this is one of those questions that anybody who's ever been a reporter will tell you that if anybody ever says to you, would you like to see my eagle? The eagle, the answer is yes, of course I want to see your eagle. <laughs> <laughs> So he goes into the house and he comes out with this stuffed bird. And, um, and, and basically what happened, the, the poor bird was flying over the village, which is really about four or five uh, dirt streets. And it collided with an electrical line and uh, fell to the ground, uh, uh, damaged. Um, father saw it. Uh, he went over to the bird and uh, I guess he broke its neck or something like that. And then he, then he took it to have it stuffed and it's, it, it is his most prized possession, mm. uh, the eagle. So um, he just set it on the back of the car and we were talking while the, while the bird was there. I, I, this, is, this image is really haunting. Um, and, and the fact that the little boy is looking straight at you is there's something really incredible about that. Um, it's almost like, he knows we're being photographed for this special <laughs> moment. Well, also Efren, I mean, it's like, as weird as the eagle is, you know, for us, having an old gringo in his village is pretty weird for him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. and, and I think you said that this was, this was one of the kids maybe of the Ogad or the- uh... this, is a, this is another shelter for children. Uh, it's yeah. run by uh, an evangelical, uh, pastor. Um, it's funded by, in part uh, by a group of evangelicals in Minnesota or someplace. And um, before the COVID, there was about 35 or 40 uh, kids there. And obviously, this was shot before that. Uh, most of them come from isolated mountain villages. And Oaxaca is the, depending who's counting, the second or third poorest state in uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the most indigenous state, meaning the highest percentage of the population that has indigenous roots. And it has the greatest percentage of people in Mexico who don't speak Spanish as a first language. Anyhow, 
right now there's only about 15 kids there because they, they had to close the school to help support it. This was a, a, another mother from the shelter that I tried to you know, photograph her and her, her, she has two, two boys. And as I explained to Efren, I mean, it, the two first families I've been photographing for six, five, six years, um, I, but I tried with others. And so um, I, they either don't relax around me um, or there's too many problems in the family. So let's say there's drug use or things like that, that I, I or I don't feel safe being there, uh, you know, right. at night. Um, anyhow, I, in this case, this relationship died after, I think I photographed her three times, uh, but I like the image. This was another attempt at another family from another indigenous culture called the Triquis. And the Triquis live near, more or less near the border of Chiapas and Guerrero. And they were very, very poor. They're the, probably the poorest community in, in Oaxaca. Mm. And um, I, um, the mother was just very uncomfortable with me being there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I spent the morning with the mother, the, her, her mother, that is the, this boy's grandmother and three or four kids. And we talked and I made pictures and I only, you know, I made a couple of good images or one or two good images, but she was just really uncomfortable. And, and when I asked her if I could come back, she said, she said, no, mm. let's stop with that. But I, there's at least a dozen times where, you know, I've sort of failed to, you know, continue with the families. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it, it goes to, it, it speaks to the, you know, how intimate this is in, in a certain way and how, it really is about getting that access and that comfort level. And, um, you know, it's not, I'm gonna just, I, I'm gonna go to this one. I, I like, I love this one because as I mentioned to you, it reminds me that in Mexico, the rules are, you know, a little bit bent, a little bit more, you can ride in the car kind of sitting out of the window, which here would be considered outrageous. Like, what is this child doing? <laughs> I just love it. Yeah. Um, and then again, this idea that, you know, celebration and getting dressed up is, is a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah, and they, they put those on, those clothes on because I was there. Okay. Um, they, they, those are their first communion clothes. And th these children are, are probably about 10, 9, and 8. And I met them in a, a village where uh, I met the father and he invited me to the house. And I photographed this, these, these folks four or five times. Um, wow. these, but these kids, oh, this picture was made two years ago, I think, uh, have never gone to school. The father doesn't believe in school. Oh my. And, but when I was photographing them this time, this was the second or third time I was there, he, he told the kids, he says, go put your new clothes on. Oh. They just had their first communions. Oh. And so they, they came out and as you can see, the day was like very sunny and the light was pretty terrible. And, um, you know, but I thought it, I thought it worked with the, you know, with the white clothes and the bright tin wall and yeah, the yeah, kid, you know. very special. Um, and then, and then this young man, and I know you wrote about him. Yeah. Well, it's a sad story. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of them are sad. Uh, you know, not, not all the kids have sad stories. Some of the kids are doing pretty well. They have complicated stories. He has a sad story. It, you know, just the very short of it is he was in a shelter for a long time. That open that picture that you saw back at the beginning with the girl hugging her mother around her back, that's, her, that's his mother and his younger sister. He spent his entire youth living in one shelter or another, uh, either five or seven days a week. Um, mm -hmm. The mother is, uh, you know, she works. She's just kind of damaged and has trouble dealing with stuff. And now he's 15 and he should be in high school, but he's not. Mm. And so he, he went to school for a little while and it's, you know, it's without getting into it all, things are very, very bureaucratic in Mexico. And um, like, if you don't show up, if you show up an hour late to buy your books, you don't get your books, mm. you know, unless so God, he didn't get his books one semester passed, so he failed the course, et cetera, et cetera. It's just like, you know, it's sort of bad luck built on bad luck. But I, I have photographed the family many times, maybe, maybe 15 or 20 times this family. 
uh, they move a lot. They move every once a year or every eight months or something like that. So in this day, they were moving and he's cleaning out the room. Most of these families, when I met them, all lived in one room, except for the woman who, um, who uh, lived on her father's farm. Um, like Irma and her two children uh, slept in the same bed for 12 years. You know, so mm -hmm. they lived in one room. Uh, and I think that explains some of the closeness, you know, Efren, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're literally close even, close even physically. So, so this next section uh, quickly is, is really kind of fun because now you're really, now you're really just documenting kind of life in the streets and, and some of these cities are incredibly colorful, incredibly busy, very full of life. And uh, you, you actually found particular scenes and places in Oaxaca that were like really thriving and really busy. I love, I love this image. I, I, I just love the fact that, you know, you, you have this kind of really long horizontal freeze of different people and, and it really makes you want to look at like, who's looking at you, who's busy with their phone. He, this, this young woman is busy with her phone. Uh, this one's kind of like looking right at you, kind of like, who are you and why are you taking a picture? Um, you've got others laughing here. It's just a really fun, it kind of shows you the, how alive this scene is uh, in just this kind of very concentrated space. And, well, I, love, uh, I love photographing on the street. You know, when I, when I was 22 or so and I got that first camera, that's how I started. And I, as I said, I, was, I wasn't any good at it. Um, and um, I think, you know, in, in Oaxaca, um, as so many, many cities in Mexico and other parts of the third world, the streets are chaotic just, or crammed with people. In this case, they're waiting for something. But, you know, there's, just, there's a lot of activity. People are, are there's a lot of, there's a lot of buses, people walk, very few people have cars, um, they're carrying stuff, it's crowded, you know, and so I, yeah. I, I love to be in, in the middle of it. And so um, over the years, I mean, I, I, I've tried to get as close to them as I do to the families. Now I try to photograph in the streets for like a few feet away from people. Um, and I don't try to hide my presence or sneak up on anybody or anything like that. I stand right in the middle of the sidewalk. Too. <laughs> and as you know, this reminded me of an iconic photograph by Gary Winogrand, even though we're in New York and in the 60s, this idea of almost like people on a bench at the World's Fair um, and everyone's kind of doing their own thing. So, so that's kind of where you took me as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then I loved that as I was looking at all your photographs, uh, you were noticing how much in, in places like Mexico, and, and again, it's, it's kind of, I think it's almost like a developing country thing. People are always carrying things. Um, you know, in the US you might see people with backpacks or a suitcase, but in a place like Mexico, you were struck by, you know, carrying the water, carrying the water again. And then you've got this woman. I love this photograph. I mean, the, the way the light is kind of focused on her and she's not only carrying things with both her hands, but you know, with the basket on her head. Um, it's, it's something very unique to countries like Mexico. Everyone's carrying things. And I even included you know, the man uh, again <laughs> carrying a child on the shoulders. The other thing um, is that, that you have some images like this one that, that just capture like this little kind of decisive moment, so to speak, or this kind of moment in time where this man is walking down this, against this wall and you just capture him with like his hand up. And it's one of those things that just looks kind of funny and different. And then you've got this, this kind of funny shadow. I'm like you know, Mexico, Efren is like, not all of Mexico, but, uh, you know, Oaxaca is um, 4,500 feet up. It's very, it's very far south. Um, so the light is very strong and it's, it's very beautiful light um, toward the end of the days. And um, 
you know, it's, you know, the thing that's, I suppose that I've learned there is to, is because I'm not lighting any of these things. It's just to, to use this harsh light as best as I can, you know, look, look for the contrast, look for the shapes and the light and things like that. Like you, the, the umbrellas. You took the umbrellas. That you, you see umbrellas everywhere because it kind of reminds us how sunny <laughs> it is. The other thing that, as, as you, you noticed, I picked up on is uh, it, it strikes me in, in the US, we rarely see balloons anymore. I mean, people take them to like someone sick in the hospital, but you don't really see like the balloon seller in the street. And that's something that, that's very much something that you have in Mexico. Um, and it's very colorful and very cheerful and it's everywhere. And here I compared it to this Versailles image in Paris <laughs> with the balloons. Um, and then you have a section in your website called Vida, Life. And so again, now you're, you're taking us, and I, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of time. We're, we'll, do, we'll do this fairly quickly. We'll okay. do a little bit of kind of like, let's look at some aspects of life. I love this one because again, the way you got so close to this young man uh, who's working in this, what appears to be this very, very busy, busy, noisy type of restaurant is wonderful. Um, I, I can almost smell the food and hear the noise from the photograph. Um, he's in complete full focus and then the rest is, you know, a little bit out of focus. It's wonderful. You. Um, and you said that it took you a lot of tries to get this image. Yeah, I went back many times. This is in a market, um, a downtown, a, well, a big market. The market occupies a block. And as part of the market, um, there is this avenue of, um, they call it the Avenida de la Carne, which is the, the meat, meat avenue. Right. And so they, they sell grill meat, grilled meat. And so that's all mm -hmm. smoked out there. And I, I mentioned Efren. I mean, I, I probably, I went back a dozen times to try to get it. I, I'm actually, there's no room. I'm actually leaning against the wall. Um, oh my God. <laughs> I, could, I could touch his, his shoulder with my hand. That's how, how close he is. And these are just other examples of, again, um, the people in Mexico are very happy people. They love to have fun. And so sometimes you might see aspects that look very sad or very difficult or poor, but they're people that love fun. I, I love this. Again, you're capturing some of the celebrations that are so important in Mexican culture. And, and as we spoke, this, this boy almost makes the picture, right? Um, <laughs> Because he's not, he's not having it. He's not just not into it, you know. It's just, you know. <laughs> and um, and then the next one, which you you said is like a combination wedding baptism, which yeah, I yeah, the bride, the bride on the left had the baby, uh, the, the baby, <laughs> whose name is Abigail, Abigail, and uh, and then they got, um, then she got married. But I mean, look at this incredible little costume. Yeah, right? it's phenomenal. And then the girls getting ready to dance uh, as, as is often done um, in, in celebrations. And then I just thought I would show some of the images. You know, one of the things you often see in, in Mexico, um, you know that the, the founder of surrealism, Andre Breton went to Mexico and he said, Mexico is about as surreal as things get. Um, and I actually think you capture in some of these images, some of that kind of surrealistic yeah. um, side of Mexico, like in this one. Um, I love this image that you captured from below. This man is, is, is at a race, it's at a race or? It's, a, it's a, a horse race. They set up horse races in the middle of cornfields. They, yeah. they, and, um, you know, once a month or something. And um, he's actually, setting up a camera at the finish line to record the finish mm -hmm. race. I love it. It's amazing. And then uh, this, this is amazing because it's like, you've got this wall, you've got no one around, you've got this young man with this enormous instrument. And there's just something, again, the word surreal comes to mind because like, <laughs> you, don't, you somehow just don't expect to see this. Mm -hmm. um, and there it is. And, and then tell us about this. 
Um, but this is a this is the same festival where a different year where there's always a bride and you can see the bride seated seated in the front row. It's a teenage boy, and uh, it celebrates the the day before Ash Wednesday. Um, and um, Lent is supposed to be a season of sacrifice, so everybody has a big blowout the day before Lent. Anyhow, they march around town and then they have a wedding. So this is a photograph of the moment of the wedding in this town uh, with the townspeople, kids, uh, as you see, ma uh, masked uh, police officer and others gathered around them. And uh, I, I don't go to a lot of festivals, but I, I go to this one every year um, because it, 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 it happened during the time that Mary Ellen Mark held her workshop in Oaxaca in the, in the spring. Anyhow, so I, I go, even though now it's become more overrun with photographers and, mm. and things like that, uh, it's harder to make this type of picture now because there's more, more people crowding around, et cetera, but. It's, it's amazing. I mean, this is the kind of photograph you can spend a while inspecting and, you know, and it's got, I mean, the boy with, with the glasses here and this little boy is kind of looking out of the, kind of a frame. Um, and there's just so much going on here. It's just amazing, even the, the baby back here. Um, it's really incredible. And then um, just to close, um, let's talk about this, well, this, this custom and these men that you photographed in one of the towns, because again, there's a custom of cross-dressing in particular for some of these carnivals or, or yeah so there's a there's a yeah there's a custom of cross dressing um and that i don't know if it predates the christianity in mexico because because even in christian times men would cross dress and shakespearean times etc uh in this case there are there are um uh, parts of oaxaca that they have a, a real cross dressing cross dressing culture in this case these these men are gay but they are cross-dressers and they march in a um, three-day parade uh, every spring in this town called Sashila. Um, and so the first year I photographed, this was the, the man who was sort of in charge of it. He was the queen of the festival and uh, he's now older. Um, and so I went and I went for a couple of years and I didn't go for a couple of years then, but the last two years I've gone and for, all three days, both times, because I, I decided I wanted to get more involved with the, the young men, because now young men are, are doing it like a next generation. And I needed mm -hmm. to, you know, get to the point where they would trust me, like in this case, where they would let me go into uh, the houses where they were getting dressed and drinking and putting on makeup. And so, you know, like in this spring, I spent three days with them. And last year, I spent mm -hmm. three days with them. Uh, and I, now I stay in touch because we have Facebook, of course. Um, and I should mention because, you know, people ask, in these cases, I always send them or give them uh, some dozens or sometimes hundreds of pictures. Uh, wow. So, you know, like, uh, it's easy yeah. these days to share pictures. And so, you know, I send them to them. That's so great. I or mean, I make them prints if they want prints, you know, but. Yeah. Well, again, it shows your... Um, yeah, your ability to kind of get to know and get involved and, and make people comfortable and, and then just kind of let you into their world. So, but I, I love this because it's also um, kind of reminds us and takes us to, you know, places like Mexico that, that we've sometimes thought of, of gee, it's, it's gonna be very conservative there, not open to these things. And actually you have this going on even in these small towns in Mexico, which is really, really great and fascinating. And then I, I just compared it to the work of uh, someone I've met who was represented by CPI, the gallery where I worked, who was looking at the same cross-dressing, but in India. Um, so it's it's something that, that's fascinating that goes on everywhere. Um, and I just wanted to close with this beautiful image because I, I just love the light kind of like coming in from the window mm -hmm. and falling upon this, this man. Um, all dressed up. So we're right at the, just past the hour. Thank you everyone for, well, well first of all, thank you, Tim. I mean, this has been a little bit rushed, um, but uh, I, I put here, 
you know, Tim's website, because the point is that you can now go and really explore his site. And there's not only these images, but many more. And I encourage you to, to read his, his writing because I think something unique about Tim is that he often accompanies his images with very interesting stories about who he actually has in the picture, you know, whether it's Irma, Alberta, or many others. And you really get, you, you really get a sense for their story and, and, and much more, you know, beyond the image itself. So with that, I'll, I'll actually shut up and I'll, I'll open it up to, to comments and questions. Um, I hope that people really enjoyed seeing your work. Thank you, Efren, thank you. Efren, can you hear me? It's Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi, that was really wonderful. Thank you very much, both of you, for setting this up and for uh, sharing that with us. It was really interesting. I just, um, just coincidentally, just became aware of a photographer. I, it couldn't be more different in terms of the subject matter um, uh, named Slim Aarons. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, and it, it, he's uh, just someone, I happened to catch a documentary on this, on this man on uh, Netflix or something. And he's someone who just focused on the, um, I guess just the, uh, the super wealthy and the, the European nobility and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. And it's just the, the contrast couldn't be greater. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just a comment, I guess, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, it's, it's a great comment. That documentary photography takes us everywhere, right? And, and, and yeah. Tim taking us to this world of Oaxaca and Slim Aarons takes us to Palm Springs yeah. and Hollywood. Complete, <laughs> complete different, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other? Any other questions or comments for Tim in particular? I'm, I'm curious. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Marion. Yes, hi. Hi, Marion. Tim, it was a great presentation. I want to ask you if you if you give any money or pay the families of the of the very poorest. Uh, subjects that you started out with? Well, yes, I don't pay them to be photographed, but because I've gotten involved with them, um, so I, I, depending on the family on different levels, um, um, I've, I've underwritten and helped out in a lot of different, different ways. Um, I've gotten very involved in an organization. I'm now on the board of directors of an organization in Mexico that pays the school cost of nearly 700 kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a direct result of me photographing these families and seeing the need. Um, uh, you know, the two families in particular, particularly Irma, um, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't like to talk about it really, but yes, I, I helped them out. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't make it an exchange for being photographed. Um, I understand. I understand. Um, but, um, you know, they, so especially with school and medical stuff. Um, then my other question was, uh, why are the teenage boys the brides in the, whatever the festival is? It's an honor to be chosen. And as part of, as Efren mentioned, it's a, in this particular festival, it's sort of an honor. And, um, you know, each Mexican village has a, a, a role a, a, of a man generally called a Mayor Domo. And he's like the, the patron. He pays for the whole, the whole festival. And mm -hmm. usually it's his son or one of his nephews that gets chosen. He's because they're like the star of the show. And he, they invite all their buddies. The buddies all dress up as young women and they have a good time. The, the transvestites are gay men. No, um, I understand that. But they, you know, there's a, a lot of the festivals um, uh, in other towns, they have men dressing as women. Um, or dressing, and not just as women, as, as devils and as spirits and as animals. And, uh, you know, it's the indigenous culture has... Um, Where do I see the guy that devil. is talking? Pardon? Sorry? Um, uh, uh, Tim, I have a question here from Sophie. Um, 
Can you speak a little bit to your choice of, you know, silver gel and prints and black and white, especially when we go way back to the 70s and Mary Ellen Mark was doing some color in India. Uh, but when you went to her workshops and your work is actually black and white, can you talk about that? Well, I, you know, I started in black and white because I'm officially old. Um, so I, you know, I, <laughs> I did, when I did the, you know, the news photography that was in black and white and it was film. Uh, when I did the magazine photography, it was digital and, and it was color. Um, and when I went to Mexico, um, the first workshop I did with Mary Ellen, I shot in color. Uh, but I, I realized that, you know, I just, I just didn't love it. And I found the color to be distracting. Um, so I, I switched it to black and white. You know, it's interesting. And now I, I, now I even, I, I shoot more and more black and white even here in California, but it's interesting. If, yeah, I'm sure you know who Alex Webb is. And so Alex Webb one night and I in, in Mexico, had a long talk because Alex Webb is a, is a very well-known uh, photographer uh, who's done a book on Mexico and other places, There's a book called Calle, which is a great book. Uh, and he photographs in color. And he, he began in black and white. And he, he says that when he discovered Mexico, Mexico was the reason that he switched to color so he could capture the vibrancy of the colors in Mexico. Mm -hmm. and for me, it was almost the opposite. You know, Mexico had so much color in it that I just found it to be distracting. I'd photograph somebody and it would be just color, color, color. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see the people. Yeah. Um, and so maybe, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't, I'll talk about printing. I don't make many prints. I didn't make, I made prints for all the magazine, all those years in the magazine, I never made a print. Uh, I mean, I did a book, uh, like a, a cookbook and we did shows, the book and stuff like that. We made prints, but I never sold prints. And anybody, you know, I, it doesn't make sense, except if you grew up in journalism and in magazines, you did stuff on assignment. And that's what it was about. It was doing assignments. And um, I started making prints about five or six years ago uh, because people asked me for them and I did a couple mm -hmm. of shows. And, uh, but I have not made silver gelatin prints. There, I make good digital prints um, and, um, but that's where it is right now. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, something that Tim mentioned to me, you're not gonna be that surprised, especially after what you just mentioned, but um, that a, a big part of photography for you is the process. It's being with those people. It's immersing yourself in their lives. It's getting the shot. The output almost winds up being I don't want to say secondary, but what you enjoy is the entire journey and the process until you actually shoot the picture. And then you've got, you know, the actual prints. Tell us about that. Um, I realize we're a little bit over time, but I think it's a fascinating uh, comment that, you know, be, being photo a photographer, a lot of it is about being with these people and being there. Yeah, I, you know, we talked about that. So I, I for me, that is the thrill. It's, um, I mean, there's several levels of thrill. I mean, there's the intimacy with the people, which are, and some of them, they're like family. I've spent so much time with them. And, um, and I, in a way, I feel almost responsible for them. But the, the, but the, the photography itself, the, the moment of the picture is the thing that, that really sort of excites me. And I have to say, it hasn't changed, even though I was, you know, I mean, I'm a better photographer now. I, I mean, if I had another 50 years, I, I think I'd, I'd be able to improve a little bit more. But you know, when I, when I began, I was really pretty terrible, but I still enjoyed pushing the big shutter on that first time, on, on the big Nikon F that I had and hearing a clunk of the, of the metal thing. And it was just, you know, you couldn't see the picture in those days. So there was nothing to look at. I mean, the, the satisfaction and the belief that you made a, had a good picture came in the moment of taking the picture. There was no way to verify that you'd made anything decent for a couple of hours if you were working in the news business or something like that and you go back and develop the film. So, you, you know, you, you had to develop this sense of knowing that you were taking something worthwhile at the moment. And so it was the looking and the taking mm -hmm. that was the photography and not the resulting image because the resulting image was just something you did with the thing that you looked at and you took. Right. Right. You know, so, and that's, it's still the same way. Now I can cheat, I can look at the back and, 
I can say, hey, you know, it's just a little dark. Maybe I'll pump it up a little bit, yeah, you know, but, but still in so many of the pictures that you saw today, and if you look at the other ones, it's not something I can reshoot. I mean, I, I, you can do a picture, a similar picture again, but if there's a moment like where the girl's walking down the street and she's looking at me and she's eating a pizza, you know, I can't retake that if I messed up the exposure, even though I have a, because I shoot everything on manual and um, because that's how I learned and that way I can control it, you know? So um, it's, you know, so I don't know. I think that, I think the, the trajectory of becoming a photographer learning how to look, you know, and then the, all the other stuff is just what you use to, you know, produce the image that you were looking at, you know, if that makes sense. I don't know, Mike. Well, I, I want to thank, I'm, 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 I'm conscious of time. Tim, I want to thank you again so much for being the, the second in this series of getting to know contemporary <laughs> photographers. It's been a pleasure to see your work. Well, thank you. Um, and, 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 and I do encourage people to go to Oaxaca. And I mean in a non-tourist way, but it is an amazing place. I can't wait to go. Um, and I uh, thanks again, Tim. And please do visit his website at Tim Porter Photography. Uh, you'll really enjoy uh, how it's set up and all the wonderful images and, and also some of Tim's writing. And I just want you to know that in January, stay tuned. Uh, someone that Tim actually knows, Jody Watkins, is a photographer. She also spent a lot of time in Mexico, but we're going to be looking at some really interesting body of work she's done in Central Park during the times of COVID. Um, so it's very timely. It's kind of like a time capsule of the fact that there was life in Central Park in the last nine months, and we're going to get to see some of that. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here. If you don't have my contact information, it's right there. If you ever want to join us and um, have a great evening and um, happy holidays. And thanks for being here. Hey, hey Efren, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure. Thanks so much. It's been, it's been great getting to know you. And Tim, I'll send you a recording and also Perfect. all the comments in the chat because some okay. of them are wonderful. Right. So thank you all for coming. Thanks, Tim. Thank you all. Bye-bye.